Welcome to 1202, the Human Factors Podcast. The podcast that covers all things about humans, technology, technology. and particularly the bit in between. And welcome to this episode. Coming up today, we are venturing into the world of safety and more specifically, how we could learn from normal work. Now, yes, I am back in the hot seat after the uh, the episode last time. Hopefully you didn't get too, um, too, uh, too upset about me not being there, but I thought that the idea of being able to hand over this um the, the this podcast to um to mike in the way that he did his interview and was able to use that for his own um for his own students and um for his own teaching was just a fantastic opportunity for both him and for the platform itself and i'm really pleased with the sort of feedback that we've had because the past month or so as well as that i've seen a huge variety of activity for the podcast and and the channel i, I still don't quite know how we're going to refer to it um given that we're now on youtube as well as the uh, audio side but it has been brilliant to see from just the wide variety of domains and disciplines engaging with each other a great example of this has been new listeners from the medical domain engaging with medical pro- uh, with practitioners from defense and energy um to an end, um, but two um and they've been having discussions based on the on the topics that we've been talking about and sharing best practice sharing ideas or sharing their thoughts on how things sh- um, sh- could be done or should be done and for me this is exactly what i was hoping to achieve uh with this channel to be able to encourage collaboration discussion to be able to prompt thoughts and ideas and but fundamentally from a human factors and ergonomics perspective opening up our profession in other news you may recall that a while ago i've been i started guest hosting on Human Factors Cast with with Nick Rome, where each week we take a Human Factors related news story and dissect it with laser-like professionalism. Or at least Nick does, I kind of just try and make funny jokes. Um, I didn't realize until it came up on my uh, my time hop, on my memories, that it's actually been a year since I've been doing that. And so it's a year ago, basically last week, I was invited to fill in the seat for the episode and clearly have got very comfortable because I haven't given it back. Uh, But what's been really brilliant about this, uh, which I also commented on the Twitter thread uh, where I sort of announced it at the time, is that we haven't been in conflict. The two channels haven't been in conflict, 1202 and, and Human Factors Cast. It's actually we've been able to sculpt and mould both of them to work really collaboratively together, but still keep their individual identities. But keeping that also ability to cross promote as as well as share ideas and and even content, which we've done around on on a number of things and and um, highlighting people to interview or bring in. So it's really made it work to fit with the styles and the and the schedules, but also it's just fantastic to be part of such a international or transatlantic collaboration. Anyway, back to this episode. As I mentioned at the top, we're talking about safety and I've got to admit that when it comes to that, I've got a basic understanding. I do, you know, I I have to have an appreciation of, of safety doing most of the work that I do. But when it gets down to the um, more in-depth me- methodologies, the uh, the more specific stuff, so particularly when we're talking about the fraction of a 0. 0.000 number um, to try and work out whether something is safe or not, I do tend to hand it over quite gladly to uh, people who are more expert than I am in that field. But it's time to rip off the band-aid. It's it's time to actually try and learn a bit more about how we can do this. And my guest today is going to help me make this a painless process for me. So this week, I'm delighted to be joined by Marcin Ma- uh, Nazaruk. And welcome, Marcin. How are you? Um, thank you so much, Barry. I'm fantastic. Thank you for having me. So before we get into this idea about talking about safety, and, and in particular, we're going to talk about how, how we can learn from normal work, I'd like to take the opportunity to find out a bit about you because quite a lot of people will know uh, know of you, will have um, worked with you um, because you've had a really quite um, extensive career in in what you're doing. Um, But what are you doing now? So what's your current role and and what are you doing on that day-to-day basis? Sure. Um, So I have recently left my global role in the corporate world. And now I use my multidisciplinary background to help companies reduce the risk of failure and uh, and, and suffering uh, while improving uh, operational efficiency by applying the combination of psychology, human factors, human performance, management tools, and uh, and some other um, uh, te- technique uh, in order to practically and tangibly reduce the risk of something going wrong. So that's right. So just to be clear then, you've, you started your own consultancy 
um, you're you're available for hire um, for that type of thing. But you're bringing in all of that that work that you've done historically. Um, where did it all begin for you? Where did where did you get involved? Why did you get involved in human factors in the first place? Yeah, um, so, so human factors was um, not on my red radar um, initially. So I started with a psychology degree, and um, at the time uh, I wanted to move into the clinical psychology. So mm -hmm. I did my clinical training, and then after having some uh, work experience, decided that it's not quite my cup of tea. So I decided to uh, uh, specialize in occupational psychology. And so I finished my master's um, with, with that specialism. Um, and then I embarked on the adventure of um, coming to the UK, where I started a professional doctorate on the topic of safety culture and safety leadership. Um, and so that was the first insights into the world of, uh, of human factors. I was quite lucky to uh, be able to um, do this uh, program uh, through uh, practice. So what that means is I was um, located uh, at the large site of a heavy manufacturing company, and I was doing some uh, trying to improve their safety culture while using science to inform me um, with with that approach. Um, and so over the years, um, then. Uh, I moved into different topics and started uh, expanding on my uh, human factors uh, understanding uh, more and more to the point that um, I was able to uh, write industry uh, guidance or, uh, for example, the human performance competency pathway, which is now available through the Chartered Institute of Ergonomics and Human Factors. At the time, I was with BP um, and we were lacking a mechanism for upskilling large groups of people at scale in a reasonable time frame with the practical focus. Um, so I envisioned this, this framework and the development of, of the pathway. Now, um, other industries um, are following through and creating their own pathway for their respective industries. So that's very exciting to see. Mm. Yeah, and, and I think your impact into places like the Institute and particularly in that, in the energy domain is, I mean, I was very grateful for, cause it was, you, you helped us a bit with the, uh, when we talked about climate ergonomics and things and, and you, you were very kind with, with a lot of your knowledge there that I think the, a lot of people, when I mentioned that I was talking to you, um, comment that just how gracious and kind you are with your knowledge. Um, the fact that you're Thank quite you. willing to talk to people and, and share what you know. Um, I'll give you a clue though, when you, come for consultancy you don't want to be giving it all out for free you, you charge them for it it's, it's worth it um so obviously you give it you've given us a glimpse there into your career path but what has been that career path what's you know you've, you went went for a, a number of different companies and stuff but um so what has what has been that evolution yeah so uh, i finished my master's with the occupational psychology like i mentioned uh then i moved into briefly uh into market research um then started my professional doctorate uh, in, in the UK, in a lovely city of, uh, of Exeter. Um, after three years of work there and winning some awards, uh, I moved to power generation. So I moved north. I lived in Warrington, which is between Liverpool and Manchester. And if you're from that area, I worked at Fiddler's Ferry Power Station. That's um, four big um, cooling towers. Uh, that are uh, visible from a large distance. So I was there for, for two years. Um, and as part of that uh, effort, I continue upskilling myself. So uh, I did additional qualification in training design and executive coaching um, and, and some more and, and formalized my safety uh, qualifications. And so after a few years there, um, I um, joined BP. Um, so that was a big shift from one uh, big site um, to a global uh, a global role. So I joined BP as a, a global safety culture advisor for the drilling unit called Global Wells Organization at the time. Um, so I traveled uh, internationally uh, doing safety culture assessment and helping leaders to improve um, their uh, their safety performance. Following that, I've had a few roles in BP. Then I was a global lead for human factors in accident investigations, uh, where I was responsible for 
the framework of how we are going to integrate human factors into the investigation process. And my uh, most recent role at the BP was um, Global Human Performance um, Advisor, uh, where I lead the human performance program uh, for the upstream segment that included many different uh, elements from investigations to upskilling safety professionals to safety leadership, touching on design um, and, and many others. And in 2019, I left BP to join uh, Baker Hughes. Um, shout out to all my fantastic colleagues uh, and friends uh, from that amazing uh, company. I've spent there nearly four years uh, leading the global effort um, to uh, implement human performance uh, program. Uh, we've trained over 3,000 leaders uh, in human performance, introduced human performance uh, competency uh, pathway, initiated a number of uh, projects to uh, integrate human factors and human performance into how we do things, and also practically applied proactive learning and learning from normal work. And on top of that, I was also leading uh, four uh, industry working groups um, that uh, focus on human factors specifically that resulted in multiple industry guidance documents and uh, resources toolkits and other materials um, so um, iogp uh, hpog spe step change in safety for for the uk um, and the time has come to start a new adventure and so um, that's a very exciting prospect now for me you certainly got a lot there where you seem to be um, not only practicing what you preach, but actually, again, sharing um, what you do. I mean, it, there's not that many people in the grand scheme of things who put so much time and effort into developing standards um, because some people sort of roll their eyes at standards and things like that. But they are so important to making sure that we can repeat um, what we're doing and make sure everything is, is you know, as it should be. Um, that is all. I mean, I can clearly see that I'm. Bef I'm gonna, and I'm gonna say this, say, say this now, so you, you can't get get away with it. We're clearly gonna have to have to have you back to dig into some of them, uh, so some of them topics because there, there's just such a wide variety of things to get into. Um, okay. uh, if you just allow me to add one more thing, because the standards, the word standards, sound so dry and and unwelcoming, and I know that, and so. Um, the, my, my focus was to, to focus more on the how-to guides rather than the standards that were designed for putting on, on the shelf. So the new IOGP guide that I was the lead author of, this is a how-to guide. This, is how, mm -hmm. this will take you through the step-by-step what you need to do and what you need to know to enable that in your organization. And then as part of the human performance oil and gas, we've developed a suite of tools, templates, resources for practitioners to use. Um, so just want to highlight that completely understand the standards are important, but there is more for the four that practitioners need. And so we wanted to fill that gap. I mean, God forbid we put some usability behind standards, you know, <laughs> to make them so you can use them. Uh, no, that, and that, that's, a, that's a great thing. So yes, we definitely have to bring you back to, to talk about some of them. But now I, can't, I, I clearly can't put it off any longer. I'm going to have to learn a bit more about safety. So we're going to take a quick break and then we'll come back. And I, I need to ask you questions. Thanks. You are listening to 1202, the Human Factors podcast. We wanted to take the opportunity to say thank you for your support. You can help further by rating us through your podcast provider, sharing us through social media and telling your friends and colleagues. Let's work together in raising awareness of the value in putting users at the center of what we do. And welcome back. We're talking to Marcy Nazaruk about safety, and particularly here, we're talking about um, how we can learn from normal work. So, Marcy, if if we get into uh, the idea, what is this idea of learning from normal work? So, this is a part of proactive learning. Okay. Yeah. And you may ask, why? why would we want to learn proactively? And the reason is because reactive learning, which is learning from failure, learning from accidents, learning from defects, learning from things that go wrong, is clearly important. 
but insufficient. Okay. The thing is that precursors of your next accident exist today, and we can find them and address them before they lead to a tragedy, loss, or suffering. If we learn how to improve things, mainly from accidents, then there are a couple problems with that. Number one is the fewer incidents we have, the fewer opportunities to learn we have. And that is now, it starts becoming a challenge for organizations that have been improving and improving. And they, they got to the point, if not zero, then almost zero, where they don't have large events and the, the events are very sporadic and rare. And so using that is now not very meaningful indicator of how you're doing. Number two is using the injuries as a metric of how well we're doing with our risk management is not a good indicator uh, of, um, of how safe we actually are. We know that some of the largest industry disasters occurred after a long time of injury-free operations. And a number of scientific studies show that lagging indicators are not a reliable source of insight into the risk. And number three is that the mainstream approach to understanding accidents is, or uh, it emphasizes that an event happened because something went wrong or failed. And the opposite, if there was no accident, the conclusion is that nothing failed and all procedures were followed and all controls were applied. However, what we now know that this is not the case. When we look into, when we observe the task, how people perform the jobs, which does not result in a, a problem, we observe the very same things that we see when we investigate accidents. People didn't follow procedures. They were missing the tools. They were, uh, they had less time available that um, that they needed to. Um, they needed more people, um, etc. Um, and so we cannot wait until someone gets hurt mm -hmm. before we start learning. We can act now, and we can start getting into those precursors of accidents without having an accident. So with that proactive learning piece then, that's that makes sense when you when you explain it like that. What does the organizations do already? What what sort what sort of typical activities would we expect if I was going to go into a, a large organization? Sure. So in my experience, the majority of organizations that um, I've been exposed to through my various industry engagements focus on investigating failures and try to explain human behavior by using mechanical failure as analogy. So let me explain. Take a car engine as an example of a simple mechanical system. Mm -hmm. Every part has a role to play for the engine to function correctly and effectively. These parts perform very specific functions and cannot be switched. They cannot be switched. They don't adapt. They don't learn over time. You cannot use a gasket to replace another part. If one part fails, the engine stops working. So for example, if a gasket fails, you will have a leak and uh, you've got a failure. And so when you investigate engine failure, you can claim that it failed because of a failure of one component. Here, the idea of a root cause makes sense and can be used fairly effectively. You will use a higher quality gasket next time or you will redesign that um, and, you and you can replace the part and the engine is working again. And I want to emphasize it because that will be important for this analogy. You can replace the part and the system starts working correctly. So when there is an accident in organizations, leaders, people often think of people as a mechanical part that, that um, failed. And so, and if we, if we somehow correct them or replace them, we will then correct, um, ad address the root cause and, um, and make the system working again. The problem is this way of thinking of using the engineering analogy, which applies to simple mechanical systems 
and trying to use it for explaining human behavior or even more complex organizational behavior is inadequate. It just it, it's not suitable for for explaining uh, and articulating how this um, uh, how this works. So even if we compared people to parts, these parts learn over time, they adapt, they change roles, they influence others, they are influenced, and so on. So you've got all that human and organization uh, organizational reality. Um, and so now having said that, I, I, in my experience, that's where I see majority. Now there is a growing wave of organizations that try to modernize that thinking. Uh, and to use human performance, uh, HOP, human organizational performance, safety two approaches, um, insights from the human factors uh, discipline. But even within that group, um, they tend to focus on applying that to failure when something fails, whether there's an accident or defect. I've recently talked with a number of global organizations, which I would consider leading in the deployment of HOP. Um, and they said that they are still not applying those tools and techniques proactively. And that's a next um, chapter on, uh, on their journey. And there is a small number of organizations that experiment with this approach because they recognize the value it can bring. And I happen to be at the forefront of this effort um, and developed the know-how expertise from guidance tools, toolkits, um, but importantly, I was able to figure out how to make it happen in large organizations in order to tangibly reduce the risk um, and tangibly reduce the, um, the harm and suffering. Cool. So, because that makes a lot of sense. I mean, I have been, you know, we've got the books with all the methodologies in. I remember I was at the Ergonomics Conference uh, this year where I was in the medical um it, it, some of the medical um, uh, talks where there, there was heated arguments over safety one and safety two and uh, and all this this type of stuff and and because we've been interviewing a, a bunch of um, a whole range of medical people recently um, it is it is interesting seeing um, what you talk about almost applied to the medical domain as being um, as is a really interesting case study so I'm, I'm going to have to do, dig some more into that. So if if that's the way we kind of do it already, and you've talked about proactive learning, so what do you? So what is this learning from normal work? Sure. How do we? How, how are we? How are we going to go ahead and do that? Yeah. So so before I focus on what is learning from normal work, let me highlight what is normal work. Okay. So um, in normal work, this is how people perform, do their jobs, that doesn't result in anything undesired, and so as part of that people adapt to changing conditions and challenges as part of their job. We call it performance variability or uh, adaptability. Um, and so, for example, imagine lifting a load using a crane. Every time an operator does this activity, there may be something different about the situation. So, for example, on Tuesday, they've got less time available than they planned for because there was an unexpected delivery of new parts um, which took some resources. On next week, there was um, the um, they were changing some parts of the plant, and so there were additional people in the area that you needed to account for in your lifting uh, space. Next week, one person is off work, so now instead of two or three people that typically needed to manage the lift, you've got um, one less, and so you need to adapt to to that. Another week, uh, another team. Uh, was managing a similar lift and they took your lifting slings and now you don't have the correct tools. And so those are the challenges that um, that people have to deal with and overcoming those challenges is part of what needs to be done to complete the task. But that adaptation to those challenges may increase the risk of something going wrong, but also is an opportunity for improvement. And there are many situations where people find ways to improve and reduce the risk. But that work through adaptations is normal work. Now, learning from that, learning from normal work, is about proactively looking into the things that make the execution of work difficult. And here lies the 
one of the differences compared to the mainstream safety management. Because in the safety, uh, the foundation of safety is identification of hazards and controlling them. And hazards are things with the potential to cause harm. And typically they refer to our physical objects or energies. And these are physical, these are engineering concepts with physical objects or energies. So we identify an object or energy that we need to control that can cause harm and we introduce uh, a control in place. And that's important. You can build safety leadership and focusing on safety behaviors um, as well. But these, these challenges, those things that make the work difficult is a new category well, not, not new from the point of view of the science, because it's been out there for a long time, but it's, it's fresh from the practitioner point of view, um, that there is something different other than hazards and behaviors that contributes to, uh, to risk. And those things are typically not captured by uh, hazard identification or, um, uh, or behavioral safety. Using the human factors speak, you could use terms like usability, accessibility, right? But those terms do not land very well on the shop floor uh, or in the front line. Um, so perhaps instead of asking people, describe the usability of this user interface for me, we can ask what makes completing this job difficult? So we simplify the language, use as much of natural language uh, as possible. And so things like, visual similarity of valves, right? So there is no clear distinction between them. Outdated procedures that include steps that don't have to be done with this task, lack of correct tools, problem with access. Those things cannot be classified as hazards because they're, they, on its own, they do not have potential to cause harm in the same way as, for example, chemical agent has uh, or a heat, right? But they do contribute to risk. And we do find them in accident investigations. Um, and this is now an opportunity because now we can, we know them, we can shed light on them, we can enable organizations to find them and address them and reduce the risk um, al along of other, other elements in safety management. That's really cool. So basically we, we, I've always been hung up on this idea that you you either have to have an accident or so I've worked on on sites where they you know they focus on we've had one accident this year and we don't we we need that to go to next year that's going to be zero and as soon as it goes up to one you're like oh the game over isn't it you've you, you've missed everything or yeah. you, you've got this hard thing on I guess near misses and things like that and in like the near miss reporting which I've always had again, a hang up about because as soon as you, you know, as, as soon as somebody turned around and said, oh, everybody's got to report at least one knee and miss a month. You're like, well, how do, how can you put a formula on the amount of knee? You, you need me to have a knee and miss to report. That doesn't seem to make sense. So this idea about, um, I guess, um, recognizing um, the, the normal, what normal work is and then therefore the risks associated with that does that does seem to make sense, uh, which so well done. Um, that, that kind of is there, but um, I guess we'll come on to how we measure it and stuff. But it, how do you, it, it feels like it's cultural change. It feels like it's, it's bigger than that. So if I've got an organization, um, does it only work with like sort of big organizations or how do I implement it? How, how would I make, how do I, how do I go to this type of thinking to make it happen? Yeah, so... Um, it is a cultural change. It is a mindset shift that underpins um, that. And so, okay, how do you implement it? So let's say that you are a safety director um, and your organization have not had previous exposure to, um, to this concept. So before we can uh, get to the shop floor or the front line with our tools and templates, we need to lay some foundations. Because the problem is that if you jump straight to trying to use some tools, it may become a frustrating experience. The what you look for is what you find principle would be at play. This principle, this psychological effect, highlights that we, our mental model, how we think about reality, drives our focus. 
and that means drives the questions that we are asking, what we are seeing, what we are able to notice. Um, and so the regardless of the tools um, that we may uh, give people, if our uh, leaders, our safety professionals uh, believe that people are to blame, um, they will find blameworthy blame behaviors instead of uh, looking into work. I remember a situation where we've asked a supervisor to complete a walkthrough talk through. That is a simple conversational method where you go through the task step by step and have a quick chat about what makes each step difficult. So there is a simple template to that. Um, so we've asked um, we've asked her to um, to do that without any previous preparation. She took the template and did her best. She found hazards, people not paying attention, and complacency. After the exercise, she complained that it wasn't do doing this, it wasn't a good use of her time because she didn't find anything new. She knew that people are complacent and they don't pay uh, attention. Now, when we um, asked um, a trained person to review the same job and the same task, um, now we, uh, we were able to find many issues with resources, work arrangements that were there all along but the supervisor was not able to see them because it was just, if, if, you, if, if it doesn't exist in your mind, you can't ask a question about it. Um, so it wasn't part of um, how she was uh, thinking. And the same applies to, to leaders. Um, if we don't prepare leaders to think differently about safety and human performance aligned with science, they will naturally have tendency to gravitate towards blame, finger pointing, administrative controls, we are all subject to the fundamental attribution error, right? So, so you've got that uh, natural gravitation. So organizations that successfully implement uh, this approach start with leaders. And that is typically some sort of workshop for leaders to give them time and space to introduce them to those ideas and, uh, and let them discuss and explore and challenge this together. And I've seen those workshops to range from half a day to a four, uh, four day long sessions. I do one day because I find that's the biggest, re best return on investment. Mm -hmm. And in my workshop, the, the we start with that uh, transformation of how we think about safety. Um, so we cover what's behind non-compliance, what's the role of workarounds, how we depend on each other, building on a system view of an organization, how you respond to failure, how to build trust and, and more. And um, the topics are based on uh, recent research um, that um, I was able to turn into practical exercise and solutions. Um, and so, so that's a leader. So once we, once we get leaders to a good place where they can um, speak to this and internalize it and uh, lead conversations with, with those concepts, we need people who will actually uh, put effort and uh, and uh, coordinate the learning activities. So we need facilitators. So facilitators are the people who will conduct those in-depth discussions and coordinate improvement actions. And the facilitation skills are really important. They really make a difference for the output. So I'll give you an example. That's all based on real experience. Imagine this. You are in the room with six crane operators. The discussion is going well. You want to explore what makes the job difficult. And one of them says the following. When we have this heavy lift on crane four, John always walks under the suspended load. For a safety professional, that is like an alarm bell ringing because you know that it's not only that's not uh, safe, the rules in place are forbidding such behavior and just yesterday you communicated that that please do not walk under the suspended load so it's like what's going on and now there is a moment now that uh, learning may or may not happen so how would you respond um depending on the question you ask you will either learn more or you will suppress suppress learning and so let's do this a quick exercise for for our uh audience i'll tell you three questions okay and tell me when, when you listen, uh, when you hear those questions, please note, pay attention to your gut feel. Are you feeling 
uh, willing to open up and and uncover more, or are you feeling more on the defensive side? Okay. So, question number one in this scenario. So, in the response to to a person saying they are walking under the load. Number one, do you know what are the rules in place? Note how are you feeling. Yeah. Number two, how long has this been going on for? And number three, tell me more about the task and what makes it difficult. So, Barry, tell me, tell me your impressions. Which question you felt was more in, most inviting for you to open up and tell what's really going on? Well, it's definitely the, the third one for me because the first two made me feel very defensive and almost like justifying what I was doing. Right, right, right. And in that moment, the learning may or may not happen. If uh, if I ask the first question, do you know what are the rules in place? You would probably get defensive, started reciting me the rules. You would then suppress the other details that are in the story. I wouldn't learn much uh, about it. You would be frustrated because you were on the edge of trusting me and now, through this subtle question, I, I suppressed it and pushed it back. Compared to the other question where I invited you um, to, to open up and explore, uh, explore together. And so this is an example where you see how facilitation makes, makes a difference and the type of questions um, that you ask. And the last bit is after you prepared leaders and facilitators, we can start implementing. And there are various tools that can be used. Leadership visits, walkthrough, talkthrough, learning team, procedure reviews, and more. And there is a spectrum from quick and easy that will give you a little bit of insight to a well-structured and even multi-day that will give you in-depth uh, intelligence into how your system um, operates. And for organizations that want to go beyond that, we, we talk about uh, comprehensive integration with their existing uh, processes, but that's for the future. So all of that then, it does require, um, and it, I guess it's almost an obvious thing to say, but um, it requires top level buy-in to what you're doing. It is, um, as you mentioned right, right from the offer, a, a, diff a really different cultural offering. That you're actually inviting people to um, be be self self critical, self analytical, um, to to open up and actually try and improve their own circumstance without just relying on the number of injuries and and deaths. I think it sounds no, it sounds really obvious thing to say, but when you describe it the way the way you have done it, you it is it is almost one of these light bulb moments of well, why wouldn't you do that already? Right. right. Um, if I do this, given that what you said earlier, um, you know, there is loads of other methods out there. There is things that people do. And, you know, we, we're at that certainly in large organizations and because the implementation of various methods and stuff, the numbers of actual incidents we're talking about are, are small. Um, if I implemented this type of approach, how do I know it's been successful? How do, how do, uh, how am I measuring it? What, what's, because the, the boards like that, don't they? Uh, the, the senior management, board, they, they want it on a nice, um, dashboard or somewhere no you know that's the big thing number of incidents zero um how am i measuring this how do i know if it's been successful excellent that's such an important question and there's a couple things to it um so let let me unpack it so let's start with the traditional measure of injury rates and so there are many places and sites where you know they still struggle with um harming people um and learning from normal work can be a very powerful um, way of reducing that. So uh, I know one company um, that achieves, for example, 37% reduction in injuries. Um, I know another one, 64% in soft tissue injuries. Those are very powerful reduction um, measures. Um, if there is... Um, strong support of the leaders at the site level and typically we are able to to measure that relatively well at the site level because the further the more you expand the more confounding variables come into play and the measurement becomes more and more um difficult so, so number one is if there are injuries this is a powerful um tool to to reduce that but now to coming back to your point is what happens when you don't have uh, accidents, injuries, or 
the number is so low that it's not really meaningful. If you've got zero and you move to one over a year, is that a meaningful um, reduction, you know, um, deterioration of your performance? Not, that, that's not a very good measure. Um, and so um, the question is how to go about that. And so let me start with a medical analogy. Um, think about a stroke or a risk of a stroke, right? That's um, possibly life-changing, that's high severity incident, and you don't want that. So although hospitals measure how many people were admitted with this heart problem, you don't want to wait to have a stroke to think how to reduce the risk of a stroke. So the medical science runs various research studies, longitudinal uh, studies, trying to find factors that increase the risk and creates a list of those factors, right? So how do you know you've reduced the risk of a stroke without having one? Analogous question, how do you know you've reduced the risk of an accident without having one? Coming back to the medical, you take a list of things that are known to contribute to the increased risk of stroke and you can address them one by one. Right? This may include the physical exercise, the cholesterol level, and so on. Now, please note that the link between the stroke, having a stroke and contributing conditions is probabilistic and not deterministic. Mm -hmm. So it means that there are people who don't exercise, have high cholesterol level, and many other contributing factors, and yet they do not have suffered from the stroke. And the opposite is true as well. You may have very healthy people who happen to have a stroke. But if you take a thousand people with certain conditions, now at the group level, you will be able to see uh, the tendency. And so now let's apply this to safety. So you have no accidents, but we know from the last 40 years of, of research and the especially last um, decade in particular on complexity and performance variability, etc we know what creates strong performance. And actually, when I say it, it may become even obvious that if people do not have the right tools and they do not have the right information and they work with outdated procedures and are given three hours to complete an eight hour job and work 16 hour shift for four weeks straight and so on, that this increase the risk of a problem. It doesn't guarantee a problem, and in fact, because people are so skilled at adapting and overcoming challenges, they manage to adapt to those conditions effectively, meaning no accidents most of the time. And so those problems do not guarantee an accident, um, but your risk is higher. So now with regard to measurement, using now injuries does not make sense or it's not, it's not that uh, useful. So we need to look into how we manage the work so that people have the right tools when they need them, that they have the right procedure that is usable, accessible, understandable, uh, etc. right? And, uh, and so the measure shifts towards how well you are enabling people, how well you're setting up the work environment to execute the work uh, efficiently with uh, what they need. And now that creates also a different shift in focus because instead of asking, do you know the rules? Or maybe in addition to, because I'm, I'm not denying the importance of, of rules, but in addition to, um, do, you, um, do you know the rules? The question, there are more effective questions. So if I ask, what do you need to be safe and efficient, right? If I prioritize the human need whatever they say, and I listen to that, and I, um, I uh, address that, that would more effectively reduce the risk of failure than me, for example, uh, policy and compliance and checking whether they do or do not understand the rules. And there is one more aspect to it, um, because when we talk about arranging the work or focusing on how the work is arranged, in organizations, it's not uncommon to see conflicting priorities that make the safe arrangement difficult. So, for example, and this is also a true story, there, there is a procurement team responsible for securing suppliers for, of spare parts 
Okay, and that team that sits in the office somewhere in a big city is rewarded for um, driving the cost down. So awarding the um, uh, the contracts based on the cost. Now, the implication of that is the put the quality of the purchase parts is lower. Those parts break more easily. And now the operator in the front line has to deal with that because either the parts fails and the equipment fails or creates other problems, leaks, for example, right? And so now they have to adapt and they have to find workarounds. Mm -hmm. And so in this scenario, the goals of the procurement department and the goals of the operations or people in operations are misaligned. Operations need high quality, high quality parts that do not leak. Uh, but that would mean the procurement team would be penalized for having higher a cost of contracts. And so you see how we are now moved with this conversation beyond the direct work environment or the situation of the operator and more into organization and how the organization sets up the environment for safe execution of work. Um, and there are some fascinating pieces of work looking into those um, conflicts uh, in priorities and misalignment between corporate functions and how this misalignment creates the uh, substandard conditions um, uh, in the front line that people then what they need to do, that's variability. They have to adapt and find best ways to finish the job with the leaking parts, right? And that leads to, um, to risks. And now having said that, we know that, we can find it, we can address it, and we can reduce the risk. So from that, then, it's not just... Because we, 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 we do focus on safety as being uh, safety or, um, you know, health and safety or she and things like that. It, 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 it's seen as the, the, the evil in the room, um, you know, because you, you, you've got to do the health and safety stuff big tick, um, generally one person. But actually, from what you're saying, if we, if we apply these sort of approaches, it's not just a, it is about keeping people safe that's in, that is important, but actually it affects, positively affects the, the quality of the output that you're giving. Uh, so therefore positively affects the business. Oh, absolutely right. Uh, absolutely right. Because there is a close link uh, between safety and operational efficiency. If you've got a, a leaking part because it was purchased by the procurement department based on the uh, in incentives to keep the cost down, of, of course, that creates a different a range of different costs, right? So you've got a leak. So you've got now, substandard uh, performance of the equipment. Now, you have to spend time on this. You spend time off uh, on the repairs or, or um, mending this. There may be time uh, knock-on effect. Um, and so, um, absolutely. Um, and mm -hmm. we, we've applied this approach not only to safety, but also to quality. And it was fantastic to see that uh, people trained in, for example, Six Sigma with um, black belts and very proficient in, um, in, in statistical methods there that underpin um, the lean approaches, they were able to actually find value in this. And they said, hey, Six Sigma, you know, gives us many things, but there is new value from here. And we found new things that we, that we couldn't address uh, before. Um, and the same when it comes to operational efficiency, whether that's um, delays or other forms of uh, equipment failure, for example, we can learn to improve and have the very tangible impact on the bottom line. So I'm now clearly convinced because I can see how this applies to a lot of the work that we do in terms of discovery workshops, in terms of engaging with new businesses, new organizations about what it is they do. So not just the safety bit, but it's, you know, you're right that it's that whole more embedding piece. And if we get it right, if we start talking about it from the beginning, then I can see that would make sense. If I as a practitioner, I want to know more. Where, what, where can I go? What can I do? Sure. So a couple, couple thoughts. As a practitioner, uh, consultant, or advisor, mm -hmm. um, if you are in, in this space as, a, uh, as our um, listener, uh, operating in the areas of safety or quality, um, I think the industry here uh, doesn't matter. Um, this we, we've seen effective, very effective application across across industries. And you would like to explore adding uh, learning from normal work to the portfolio of of services. Please get in touch. Um, there is ways that we uh, could explore working together 
uh, to um, so you can access the materials, my know-how, and um, and make it part of your uh, of your offering. If you work in academia and um, you would like to offer your students a practitioner course uh, or a workshop uh, on this topic, uh, also please uh, please get in touch. Um, um, I know that um, um, there are a few universities uh, in the world that um, offer um, this approach as part of a bit broader curriculum. Um, and so that may be a very exciting uh, prospect to um, expose students and give students very practical tools and insight into real stories and examples. Um, and if you work in a large organization, and so whether it's safety, quality, um, or op operations, um, and you would like to, um, and you would like to apply it, what I would say, go to the um, www.learningfromnormalwork.com and explore the website. Um, there are a number of resources there, a um, number of videos explaining what it is, how this works, some examples. Um, you can also sign up for a free email course there that will take you uh, through the main concepts um, and enablers of successful implementation through a series of um, short emails um, as a resource. Um, and by all means, uh, there will be a contact there. You will you can see my calendar there. Um, so feel free to uh, to schedule a uh, a chat um, just to see how um, how this may. Uh, how this may fit and we've got a number of various resources from digital learning to um to different courses um that um that are available from one hour short briefings to um to full day workshops so if that's of interest uh, i'd love to hear from you there we go so that's really useful and i would just Clearly, I was at a slight gap there because I was trying to play with the technology to see if I could put the link up on for the, your YouTube people. Um, you should be able to see the link on the bottom left now for learningfromnormalwork.com. Um, I hope that's spelled right. Um, the um, yeah, don't, don't ever do things live with with animals like myself. Um, no, that's really fascinating, and I think there is a massive opportunity here for if you're a human practice practitioner to um, to to actually use this as as a as um, like you said, Martin, the 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 idea about having uh, having in your portfolio um, of what you're doing, but also for organisations to to take this on. That has been, as I said at the beginning, safety is something you know it's 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 a big topic, and we all touch upon it. But when you get the sort of safety experts such as such as yourself, I'm more than happy, or have done in the past, been willing just to say, right, we're now delving into some deep safety stuff. I'm going to hand it over to somebody else because um, it's too difficult. It deals with very minute numbers and and really that bit about what you're saying around, um, you, you know, we're dealing with um, really small numbers of, of things and it, how do we make it apply? But I think what you've been through today has really helped me understand, um, actually, we could do it differently um, and we could do it possibly more efficiently. Before I let you go, um, I have three questions that I ask um everyone and and so i will abuse this the, the the last bit of this time um to go through these what, what we call cunningly the final three questions just before barry gets to the final three my name's nick rome let me tell you about this technology in our world is evolving at a phenomenal pace and keeping up with what that means in the human factors world can be challenging that's where Human Factors Cast comes in. Human Factors Cast is a weekly podcast that highlights and breaks down stories that are chosen by you, the Human Factors community. Each week, a panel made up of Human Factors practitioners, UX specialists, and engineers sit down to discuss a weekly dose of knowledge that keeps you up to date with the latest areas of interest. New York State is giving out hundreds of robots as companions for the elderly. Buttons in cars are safer and quicker to use than touch screen. A prototype just achieved a major milestone that actually fits the description of a flying car. The show provides perspective based on experiences from different domains and different industries. We even cover some of the hottest conferences in the field. On this episode, we're recapping EHF, Ergonomics and Human Factors Conference, Neuro Ergonomics Conference, Human Factors and Ergonomics Society, uh, UXPA International, the International Symposium on Human Factors and Ergonomics in Healthcare, 
and we have the best guests. I'm joined today by Chris Reed, Micah Inslee, Farzan Sassen Gohar, Joe Keebler, Peter and Gabby Hancock. We have a dedicated community of listeners that engage with the show and contribute to the topics discussed. Join me, Nick Rome. And me, Barry Kirby. Every Friday morning when Human Factors Cast drops on YouTube and your favorite podcast directory. And remember, it, it depends. depends. Um, so if you, have you got a book or a paper? So on my desk, I have like a, a, a um, almost the a Human Factors Bible that I, I, I ha always have on there because I'm always dipping in it. Um, do you have a book or a paper that you constantly go back to repeatedly? Oh, if you don't have a technical book, it could be a fiction book. Um. So I've got a book that have um, a big impact um, on me. And actually, I, I'd like to men mention two. Um, uh, one is the Field Guide to Human Error Investigations by Professor Sidney Decker. I think that's a fantastic uh, entry point to the world of uh, human organizational performance, the, human, the science of human error, uh, and how it applies uh, to safety. And the second book that had a big influence is called Improving Performance by Ramler and Breish. Um, those are um, very, very well known figures in the discipline of human performance improvement, which is the, call it, um, uh, modern behavioral science applied to organizations. Uh, perhaps dominant in the US with their own uh, professional bodies. But the important thing is, and the very influential um aspects uh in ideas presented in these books is that not only they are result oriented but they see organizations as systems and based on that they've developed a very practical um set of tools and mechanisms to change organizations and uh, and systems and so then people play different parts in that bigger picture of uh, of an organization so um uh, so if, if you've had a chance, um, please definitely, um, definitely check it out. Cool. Um, if you, if you could, if you could go back a number of years and it's up to you how many years you want to go back, um, what advice would you give your younger self? Yeah. So I've, I've had a period of time when I focused a lot of learning and not enough doing. Mm -hmm. And I think there was value in that, and there are different types of learning. But um, for me, for a person who would like to make a positive impact on the world and, um, and, and introduce tangible change, learning through doing is key. Um, and it took me a while to, to understand that, but, um, but therefore, the, the advice would be don't be afraid to start doing things that you may not be fully comfortable with or you may not feel mastery uh, with, but learn from the experience of, of, of applying it um, because that probably will lead to making the change more quickly than reading a library uh, of, of, of books that never materialize in, in a practical action. I'm so pleased to hear somebody justify my entire existence. That's <laughs> uh, so final one then. Obviously, um, I like reaching out to um, to new and different people. Um, who would you like to hear me interview next? Um, uh, please um, you, uh, consider inviting Diane Chadwick-Jones um, for, for the interview. She is one of the thought leaders. Um, in this area, um, and um, and helps organizations um, to support the leaders on this transition uh, journey to a different way of of thinking. So, um, and we work together and, uh, on a number of uh, papers and pieces of work, whether that's uh, modernizing just culture or exploring the link between uh, financial bonuses and incentives and safety performance. Um, uh, she has a breadth of insight um, and experience um, that is uh, very beneficial. Fantastic. And that sounds like a really good complimentary type of interview as well. So thank you, Marcin, for your insights today. It has been a, a fantastic education, um, certainly for me, and I hope our listeners out there too. And you've given me that 
an appetite, I think, more so than I recognised that I would around delving into um, safety a bit more and how and certainly how can I integrate that into my day to day activities um, and also reach out a bit more about learning about how I could deliver it um, more for my clients. Um, so thank you for your time and also thank you all at home for listening or in the car or in the office, wherever you're at. Um, hopefully, no matter what happens, we will see you on the next episode. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you for listening to 1202, the Human, the Human Factors, Factors Podcast. Podcast. Please do get in touch with your thoughts, questions, and comments. You can contact us on social media such as Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook at 1202 Podcast. See you next See you time. Next. And remember, it's more than just common sense.